Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Linda Hasha. I'm the Executive Director of Opportunity Alliance Nevada. And we're really happy to have you join us today for this panel discussion on the Health Wealth Connection. A few housekeeping uh, items before we start. We're gonna place everybody on mute. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box. And any questions you have, go ahead and post in there. And we're gonna keep track and answer those questions for you. Um, I want to remind you that the purpose of the series um, that we're hosting is to examine and understand the impacts of the past, discuss and explore opportunities for change and improvement going forward, and to provide a forum to have this conversation. So again, we really appreciate everybody being here and um, participating with us in this important discussion. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to share some information about Opportunity Alliance Nevada who we are, what we do. Um, we are a statewide organization and we bring together resources and people from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds um, to investigate and understand the barriers faced by struggling low to moderate income folks and provide pathways to self-sufficiency. We get this done primarily through training, financial coaching, mentorship, education and advocacy partnerships and collaborations. We collaborate and partner with public, private, and nonprofit organizations, and that's done through with an effort to build the financial wellness of their employees and the clients they serve. We offer trainings such as Bridges Out of Poverty, uh, financial coaching training, and Getting Ahead and Adjust Getting by World. We investigate, educate, and advocate for policies that provide pathways for all Nevadans to build wealth and economic security. And that really leads us to today, the third panel in our series. We have discussed wealth disparities and housing gaps in our two previous discussions. And today we will be discussing the health wealth approach for an inclusive economy. We know that where people live and other factors affect their health. We are very happy to have a, an experienced, engaged, and passionate uh, panel to lead this conversation today. We don't necessarily view ourselves as the experts on topics of racial, racial economic disparities. So we've invited national, state, and local experts to lead this very important conversation. We are happy to be able to convene this forum and bring the experts to the table. Our mission, as I mentioned, where our goal is to build self-sufficiency and financial stability for all Nevadans and to stabilize and improve the lives and families of in and individuals. Um, with the recent national events related to racial injustice, we wanted to provide a forum to discuss pathways to racial economic justice. We want you to know we stand in solidarity with the fight against systemic racial economic disparities and the historic financial oppression of people of color. We are really inspired by so many in our community who are using their voices and making changes. We want you to know we see you and we are here with you. Linda, so, yes. we, we can't see you. Your background has blocked you. How's that? Better. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, so our goal today is to talk about it. We're gonna, uh, this is intended to be an open and direct forum for everybody. The focus will be on finance, financial and ac ac economic factors. And we just ask that the conversation remain respectful and thoughtful. We really appreciate you being here today and participating in this discussion. So now I'd like to uh, welcome our moderator, Kip Ortenberger. He's also the host of the Nevada Weekly Show on Vegas PBS. And he has graciously agreed to moderate with us through this panel in this entire series. So thank you and welcome, Kip. Well, thank you, Linda. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Opportunity Alliance of Nevada for putting on this series again. Um, we've had some great conversations up until this point. I think this is a great conversation that is going to continue and also um, probably uh, rehash some of the, the main keys, the main the talking points, main topics that we covered in the first two um, so I'm really, really excited to get the conversation started. Um, I don't have bios of our two panelists, so I, I, wanted, I want them to just maybe give some really quick background um, of, of why they are on our panel here and their expertise. And uh, John, if we can start with you and just give us a, a real quick um, background on, on uh, your experience. 
Sure. I'm currently Associate Dean for the Office of Statewide Initiatives at the University of Nevada, Reno in uh, School of Medicine and uh, have been studying uh, uh, public health and health workforce issues for uh, about three decades. Uh, I got my uh, undergraduate and master's degree in sociology uh, at the University of Oklahoma and a PhD at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, also spent a year in Sweden. So uh, you'll get a little flavor of my uh, biography uh, throughout this. But uh, while I uh, spend a, a lot of my day job focusing on healthcare and health policy, it's informed by uh, all those degrees in sociology, um, uh, a year in Sweden, and uh, other things that have uh, made me very interested in uh, social inequalities in health. Wonderful. Thank you, John. We're, we're happy to have you. And, and Bina, uh, can you give us a little bit of background, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Bina Srimali. I'm a senior researcher at the San Francisco Fed. And my background is in public health. I have a doctorate in public health, and my background is in social epidemiology. Um, John and I have a lot of shared interests, and I'm looking forward to his comments there. Um, I studied epidemiology and biostatistics as um, for my master's and economics and English as an undergrad. So I feel like we have a lot of uh, multi-sector sort of approaches here, um, which are exciting. As you'll see, it all sort of fits together, you'll hear in our comments. Well, Bina, welcome. Thank you very much for being part of the panel. And of course, thank you to our audience for, for joining us today and spending the time for this discussion. It's really, really important. I wanted to just start off, and the, the, the format of the series will be a little bit different than what we did in the first two series, where it was more uh, conversational. Uh, Bina and, and John both have prepared uh, presentations. That'll be the core of what uh, our content will be today. We will have follow-up questions in between each, and um, it was actually, I believe, my suggestion that we split up those, those presentations into three different parts. Um, so you can blame me if that narrative doesn't quite go the way I thought it might if by splitting it up. We're going to try that, and so we'll have three different opportunities for you, the audience, to ask questions. So if you've got questions in each presentation, go ahead and text those. I will see those, and I will get to those and follow-up questions um, in between each presentation. I'm thinking we'll probably have about five minutes in between each. Uh, with, with that said, uh, let's get into the first presentation, Bina, please. Great, I'm uh, working on sharing my screen here. Okay, does that look good? Can you all see that? Okay, great. Um, so thank you, first of all, to uh, Opportunity Alliance Nevada to Linda, Kip, Tracy, John, for all of um, the thoughtful work that went into planning this session. Um, I, as I mentioned, I work in community development at the San Francisco Fed, and our work there, um, our vision for that work is for a healthy and inclusive economy in which all people can fully participate and no one is left behind. And the ways that we work towards achieving that, that uh, vision are through strategic partnerships, oops, I'm sorry, through strategic partnerships and, um, and research that focuses on removing structural barriers to opportunity for low-income communities and for communities of color. So I'm really excited to be here today to share health wealth approaches. What I'm going to share with you today is informed both by my studies in social epidemiology that I mentioned, but also I worked for several years at a local health department. And during that time, I did a lot of cross-sector partnership with folks that were working on, on, in the asset building community. And so I feel um, uh, that you'll hear sort of that in, in my approach. And I also want to invite you as I'm um, speaking, I'm not sure if I could actually see the chat, but I, I would love for you to share your input as I'm speaking and I'll look at the chat box afterward. I, I want this to be as engaging and interactive as possible given, you know, the current virtual environment we're in. So um, I need to give the standard Fed disclaimer that these views are my own and not necessarily those of the Fed system or the SF Fed. Um, so I'm splitting my talk today into two parts. Give me one second, I need to move this window. Um, the first, in the first part, I'm going to talk about how health is not health care and how structural racism, the racial wealth gap, 
uh, all contribute to health disparities that we see. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about understanding and leveraging your own power and privilege. And I think part the rationale here is that the issues that we're talking about today are big, but really the kind of change we need to uh, catalyze in communities starts with us looking inwards and getting a really good sense of where we sit and what we can leverage in terms of our own power and privilege. And then in part two, I'm going to share um, a promising multi-sector practice that I'm really excited about focused on providing unconditional cash to uh, stabilize um, income during pregnancy and improve uh, health outcomes at birth and reduce racial disparities. So um, with, before, I, before I jump in, I just want to uh, articulate that at the SF Fed, we really see racial equity as critical to our, um, you know, to our mandate, our mandate for maximum employment. If we overlook and undervalue the contributions of communities of color, we're really going to limit our shared prosperity as a society. So I think that's a really important um, uh, thing that I wanted to tell you before we jump right in. So let's start here. Health is not health care. Uh, we know that um, health is really a product of one's experiences and opportunities over a lifetime. And one quote from a social epidemiologist, Ichiro Kawachi, that I like is, you know, you can say, Aspirin is going to cure my headache, but not having aspirin is not the reason that I'm sick in the first place. So really in the, in the United States context, we tend to think of health in this paradigm of medical care, and there's a lot of conversation about medical care, but really our health and the way it develops is, is much more holistic in terms of the things that keep us healthy. Um, so when you look at this map, this is a life expectancy by a census tract. Um, this map, you can see that that health is not randomly distributed. If you drive a matter of miles, you'll see sometimes years of change in life expectancy. So in terms of thinking about why that is, place is really an important contributor in driving health. So where you live determines your level of access to resources and opportunities that produce good health. Things like safe, walkable streets, schools, good jobs, and where you live can also shape your exposure to things that make you less healthy. Crime and violence, fast food, under-resourced schools, housing that's maybe old and unmaintained. And importantly, um, in our country, we've had a history of discrimin discriminatory policies and practices that have tied race, socioeconomic status together and produced communities of opportunity for some and disinvested communities for other, others. Um, and I want to note in particular wealth building opportunities through home ownership. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on this slide. So structural racism is at the root of residential segregation, economic inequities, and poor health. So starting in the 1930s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was a federal agency, um, began doing redlining maps. I think we've talked about this on previous sessions, so I'm not gonna go deep into this, but that's just one example of the ways that we sort of codified racially explicit language that disinvested communities into our laws. And here are a few other examples, looking at you know, more investments in highways to build out the suburbs while there was disinvestment in urban centers, uh, middle-class and white flight to suburbs, racial steering and blockbusting, and in the most more recent period, um, at, during our last recession, we, there's documented evidence of racial targeting of subprime loans. And we know that was a huge time period where there was a lot of loss of wealth in communities of color. So these are historical practices, but they're also things that are ongoing. And so it's really important to note that the communities that we, communities of opportunity and disinvested communities and that map of life expectancy, those things did not happen by accident. There is a context in which those things um, that those things occurred, that, and that legacy continues today. So what are we going to do about it? How do we begin to change these conditions, these conditions that shape health in communities, and how do we begin to undo these, you know, decades of racism, arguably longer than decades of racism that we've had? Um, one of the things that I think is really critical is that we start by looking inward. So I'm, I'm going to you know, many of you have already done this work of looking inward and really understanding your own racial identity and the privilege that comes with it. But I think it's important that we all start from a shared framework. So I'm going to dig into this a little bit. 
So I'm going to start us off with this quote from Bell Hooks. Privilege is not in and of itself bad. What matters is what we do with privilege. So everyone has um, many identities, age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. These are just a few of the identities that we hold. And some of these are things that people can see really easily. And some of these are more internalized or not always easy to see like a disability, socioeconomic status, education level, and which each of these identities bring um, privilege or dis disadvantage that's assigned socially. So members of dominant groups are privileged and they may knowingly or unknowingly exploit and reap unfair advantage over members of disadvantaged groups. This doesn't mean that they're rich, that things come easy to them, that everything gets handed to them, that they have an easy life. It just means that they're invisibly aided by their identity because it matches with the social norm or with the majority. So um, th just thinking a little bit more about this, members of privileged social groups often have the power to define and name reality, to determine what is normal, what is real, what is correct. And um, differential and unfair treatment is often institutionalized and codified into our laws and practices, just as I was describing on that previous slide. The, the slides that I was um, talking about earlier really talk about how race as a particular salient, particularly salient dimension of identity has been codified into our laws and practices. But it's not the only one. You can think of other examples of ways identity has been codified into our laws and practices. So one thing that's really important to consider is that given that we each have multiple identities, we can be both privileged and disadvantaged at the same time. So, uh, you know, somebody who's a person of color may also be very wealthy or somebody who, um, you know, sometimes these things go all in a negative direction, right? You have people of color who are facing a lot of uh, marginalized identities at the same time. That, that, the term that describes that is intersectionality. So here's um, a chart that's, uh, this is a bit of shorthand, and none of these things are set in stone. There's a lot of gray area around this, but just this chart shows different types of our identities, disadvantages that, disadvantaged groups and privileged groups. So um, racial here is at the top, and based on the data, this is the most salient and important identity um, that, you know, that uh, the most important and salient dimension of our identity. Um, because for across all these other identities, disadvantaged identities, that race actually um, co compounds those disadvantages. But when you look down the list, you see other things like age, um, which can go in either direction. People sometimes over 40 are disadvantaged or less centered in the media, but you young people are you know don't have the don't have power and aren't able to vote. Um, and then you can look down and see things that are maybe like less important, but also different dimensions of identity. If you're a left-handed person, you'll, you know right away that the world is really designed for right-handed people. Um, so all to say these things can go in different directions, but they're all really important ways that we should be looking inward and thinking about what are our identities, where are we advantaged, and where are we disadvantaged. And so along those lines, um, I want to share this definition of othering. Othering is a set of dynamics, processes, and structures that engender marginality and persistent inequality across any of the full range of human differences based on group identities. So some examples of that are racism, sexism, ageism. So this sort of broadens our frame so we can think about racial inequities within this context of othering and, and the ways that, you know, it, as humans, we're hardwired to see differences and to assign ourselves into our groups and clans. So unless we're actively working to sort of be conscious of that in all of our exchanges and be sort of doing that accounting around our privilege and disadvantage, we're not really, we're, we're going to continue to be playing whack-a-mole in terms of how we, um, we are addressing these inequities in society. Um, okay, so how do, how do we responsibly wield power and privilege? The first thing is thinking about it, identifying ourselves and our positions on these dimensions, and then committing to self-education and listening to and learning from other people's challenges. 
and then talk about it, get comfortable being uncomfortable, challenge others, ask questions, invite perspectives, exchange data, and then act on it. Amplify voices of people who have less power and privilege, decenter yourself, support underrepresented groups um, to speak, write, and teach. And if you are a person from a disadvantaged group, take opportunities to speak up as well. And what's really important about this is um, this, depending on where you are in terms of your advantage and disadvantage, the onus is either to take responsibility for your privilege or to take care of yourself. So if you're a person with privilege and you could fight a little bit longer, then do it. But if you're a person of a historically marginalized group, we want you to be alive, we want you to be healthy in order to continue this fight toward justice. Um, I appreciate this quote in terms of what is our responsibility to society, how do we leverage our privilege in terms of creating a better world, and also how, what is our responsibility to ourselves? How do we take care of ourselves? So with that, I'm going to stop here and turn it over to John. Um, thank you for your time so far. Thank you, Vina. And John, before you start, I just had a, I was want to check chat really quick. I don't think we have any follow-up questions. Vina, I have one for you. Um, get comfortable being uncomfortable. I think this is something that we have talked about here and there in our first two conversations, but maybe not as explicitly as maybe we can here. Um, you know, in, in a political correct world, of course, um, we sometimes can be very, very careful in how we are exploring these issues and how specifically when we are talking to somebody, especially um, because we're talking about communities of color, persons of color, more so here, um, of asking the right questions. Um, can you give us maybe some, some context on, you know, how we do that? And I, I want to link this to what you said about, you know, invisibly aided. Um, and potentially having implicit biases that we're not even aware of um, and being able to ferret those out, so to speak, challenging ourselves in a way, um, especially when we are interacting with communities of color, persons of color, um, to, to be able to, to open the communication a little bit so that we can um, get to exactly what you're saying. Great. Um, that, is a, that is a difficult question. I hear where you're coming from with that. And I think it's more important to have the conversation and make mistakes and take responsibility for those mistakes. It's always a possibility to go back and apologize, to ask people if something um, struck them the wrong way, and to be the kind of person who's open to receiving that feedback. I think that that takes, some, sometimes the word I hear to describe that is racial stamina. Like we have to be willing to accept criticism and create um, an environment in our relationships where we are open to receiving that and we put it out as something we could say, you know, I'm working more on being more explicit around racial issues, racial equity issues, and I would appreciate your help in calling me out if I get something wrong. And really also, also taking the opportunity to um, be humble uh, one of the frameworks I appreciate is um, Dr. Melanie Turvalon's idea around cultural humility and that idea that if you are trying to really understand somebody else's experience, you really need to be listening. And for a long time, you need to be quiet, you know, and really, really accept that other people's experiences are valid and that you are hearing things that you have never experienced and, and really identifying the truth there. So I think those two things together will go a long way in creating comfort. And also just recognize comfort shouldn't be the goal. I mean, these are like, that's not, um, if you're uncomfortable, you should feel good that you're leading into your edge. So you could get more experience, but you probably won't get comfortable. So I, I, I correct myself there. Great points, great points. Thank you, Bina, appreciate it. Uh, John, take it away. All right, uh, can somebody give me a thumbs up to let me know you can see my slides? Can you all see my slides? We can. I can't do anything in life without a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, I've, I've uh, organized my remarks uh, around some uh, slides and data that uh, I thought would be of great interest to this uh, group. And uh, a lot of what you will hear from me will be in sync with um, uh, what Dean has already presented and some of her concluding remarks. Uh, I, I learn something every day and uh, in the process of putting together uh, this panel and presentation, 
uh, I was thrilled to know that the Federal Reserve Bank uh, hires people with doctoral degrees in public health. Um, it, it's renewed my faith in the, in the federal government. Um, uh, but anyway, um, I, I noticed that uh, among the participants is a former student of mine, uh, Lisa Marie Lightfoot. So uh, Lisa, bear with me because you've heard this story. I began almost every uh, health policy or public health course uh, that I teach with this analogy because um, uh, it's a great way of framing uh, health uh, determinants and having us think about uh, upstream versus downstream uh, determinants of health. So um, let me just share this, this story that I heard as an uh, undergraduate uh, way back in the day uh, in a medical sociology class. It comes from uh, disability rights uh, advocate Irving Zola, who says, quote, I'm standing by the shore of a swiftly flowing river and hear the cry of a drowning man. So I jump in the river, put my arms around him, pull him to the shore and apply artificial respiration. But just when he begins to breathe, there's another cry for help. So I jump into the river, reach him, pull him to the shore, apply artificial, artificial respiration, and then, and just as he begins to breathe, another cry for help. So back in the river again, reaching, pulling, applying, breathing, and then another yell. Again and again, without end goes the sequence. I'm so busy jumping in, pulling them to shore, applying artificial respiration, that I have no time to see who in the hell is upstream pushing them all in. And I use that uh, metaphor uh, because a lot of the way we think about health is just what Bina said, and that is we equate health uh, and good health with access to care, uh, knowing that uh, it is a lot more than uh, access to care. Uh, it is largely the product of uh, upstream determinants of health and uh, uh, germane to this discussion today, uh, affected mightily by health inequalities. I thought I'd start off by sharing a little bit of data from uh, a landmark study uh, by British uh, epidemiologist Michael Marmot. Uh, this uh, uh, study got its start uh, in the late 60s and continued for a couple of decades afterwards. Uh, Marmot's premise was that health inequalities and the social determinants of health are not a footnote to the determinants of health or some, some side issue. They are the main issue and that is um, uh, important for uh, the, the direction I want to take our discussion in that I believe that improving population health and addressing health uh, uh, inequalities and disparities uh, uh, is, is, is not an academic issue. It is, it is a matter of uh, social justice. So I promised um, uh, a little bit of um, uh, discussion on, uh, again, things that were influential in uh, my professional career and very early on in my career. So uh, th this was um, uh, close to uh, 30 years ago, uh, a newly minted PhD working at the Hopkins School of Public Health. Uh, a series of reports came out from, again, Michael Marmot um, uh, and it was the, referred to as the Whitehall study. So what Marmot did is he uh, uh, randomly selected a, a substantially large group of civil servants in the uh, um, uh, uh, British federal government and began tracking health outcomes, including mortality and type of mortality over the uh, 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 next couple of uh, decades. Now, what's really unique about this group of people he selected uh, in this study was that uh, in no way could you really think of this group as um, being separated by those uh, who were materially advantaged versus those who uh, uh, suffered by any, any uh, 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 material deprivation. Uh, these were uh, all employed individuals, again, in the British uh, uh, Civil Service. They all had health insurance and uh, uh, none of them uh, worked in manual occupations, okay? So what the groups were divided by were uh, those at the top of the social hierarchy, those in administrative positions or at the top of, of the uh, organizational uh, hierarchy, next followed by professionals and executives, 
followed by clerical, and then finally by uh, other uh, uh, category of occupations, uh, doormen, um, uh, janitorial staff, and so forth um, uh, in the British Civil Service. And what he found was remarkable, and that is uh, when he looked at this group, a 10-year interval, 20-year interval, and then down the road, what he found every time he stopped to look at who was still living and who had um, uh, passed away was uh, a, a material advantage for administrative um, uh, that was greater than that of uh, professionals and executives, which was greater than clerical, which was greater than that uh, of those at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Um, uh, and it was very powerful because what he uh, also found out is that, that that could not be attributed to age. It could not be attributed to smoking, diet, uh, and other risk factors to health. And what he found was adjusting for all those factors, the gradient persisted. And uh, uh, finally, and this, this slide's a little fuzzy because I, I copied it out of a, a textbook, but uh, what he found was that that gradient persisted, again, professionals, executives having an advantage uh, mortality-wise versus clerical versus those at the bottom of the hierarchy for all causes of death, for heart disease, for cancer, and uh, uh, other, other forms of illness. Now, the takeaway uh, from these um, uh, sets of studies, and uh, I will uh, uh, shift to uh, topics of race and ethnicity in a moment, was that people with more income, wealth, education, resources, and social standing tend to live longer and healthier lives. And that's, again, controlling for age. It's not an artifact of one group being older than the other. Even when you control for factors like smoking, the gradient uh, persists. Now, he also cautioned, uh, even though he was looking at uh, uh, hierarchy in British social, uh, civil service rather, uh, that while the gradient is stable and enduring, that is, it, it just does not change over time, uh, it's an inherently complex one uh, for reasons that um, uh, Bina referred to. And that is, uh, it's not only the intersection of class and social position, race and ethnicity, gender, and other social uh, determinants um, uh, uh, make, make it inherently complex. And finally, and I think important for any discussion of wealth and health, is that uh, those uh, factors tend to compound one another, which is to say they accumulate um, uh, from generation to generation. I now want to uh, uh, share a little bit of uh, more local uh, uh, data and information. Uh, this is a map put together by um, uh, the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Fortunately, they were uh, focusing on large metropolitan areas and included um, uh, this map of Las Vegas um, uh, in, their, in their collection. Um, and, and it's to highlight what has now uh, become um, uh, kind of axiomatic in public health, and that is your zip code is a greater predictor of health and well-being, uh, uh, mortality, life expectancy, and so forth. Um, uh, 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 and that the zip code uh, is more important than uh, your genetic code uh, to uh, finalize the analogy. I, I had an interesting experience. Um, uh, Senator Spearman from Las Vegas asked me to uh, make a presentation a couple of years ago to uh, the Interim Health Committee and uh, asked me to speak to the issue of uh, the promise of public health. And I included this slide in the presentation and we ended up talking uh, for about a third of the meeting on this slide. She would not let me go on. She was so intrigued by this. And I think she was intrigued because this is a, a pretty uh, uh, a stunning yet simple uh, uh, portrait of health and well-being in Las Vegas. If you ever had to summarize uh, health in Las Vegas in one slide, this is, this is still it. And what it demonstrates is, uh, again, variation in life expectancy uh, from uh, uh, zip code to zip code uh, uh, in, in, the, in the valley. It's, it, this is four or five years old uh, data-wise, but uh, I think still, still holds up. So that when you look at, for example, uh, let's just uh, go uh, north to south, 
um, um, and, and look at zip code 89106. That is a zip code uh, in which the uh, average household income is about 29 grand. 40% um, uh, 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 of the population is black as compared to 29% being white. Uh, mostly renters rather than owners, those who do own homes, the uh, uh, median house uh, uh, or the uh, 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 home values are about 89,000. Travel on down Interstate 15. If you're coming from that area, you're probably taking public transportation, so uh, good luck uh, with that. But uh, by the time you reach uh, zip code 89139 or 89183, you see a mortality advantage of uh, anywhere from uh, uh, nine to 14 years. That is 14 additional years of life separate uh, uh, both uh, North Las Vegas uh, from residents uh, in the southern part of the valley. Um, if you look at uh, zip code 89139, a couple of uh, uh, interesting things leap out at you. 59% of that zip code is white as compared to only 8% who are black. Uh, 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 majority of uh, individuals in that zip code own their own homes. Uh, the average household income, uh, much greater than that of 89106, about $62,000 uh, per year per household, and the average housing value has probably gone up uh, since uh, I, I was uh, able to get this data uh, from a couple of years ago, uh, stands at $160,000. So, very different um, uh, uh, social and economic circumstances that I would argue translate uh, uh, to, frankly, uh, uh, disturbing disparities in life expectancy in one community. So now I want to turn a little bit to the data, share some uh, information. This is actually data uh, that comes from, uh, came from a report released earlier this week from the National Center uh, for health statistics. And uh, what it highlights is a couple of things. Uh, there's a good news story in here, and that is across uh, all uh, uh, race and ethnic groups, uh, with the exception of uh, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, we see um, uh, a drop in uh, the infant death rate when we look at um, uh, 2017 as a com uh, compared to 2018 data. Uh, uh, what we also see is uh, some pretty striking uh, differences across uh, race and ethnic groups in terms of, of uh, infant mortality rates. And again, this is, a, this is uh, just a, 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 a bedrock measure of population health, uh, looking at uh, the number of infants who uh, uh, die each year per 100,000 uh, live births, uh, again, by region or uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, the, the black rate uh, has uh, stubbornly uh, remained above the white rate uh, for as long as the feds have been collecting this data. Um, uh, likewise, uh, when we look uh, at um, uh, that, that American Indian, um, uh, Alaskan uh, native uh, rate has also been uh, uh, close to uh, uh, twice that of the, the white rate. Uh, there's one thing that uh, also troubles me. It's uh, what you see uh, for that native Hawaiian and other uh, Pacific Islander. Um, I've, I've never seen, uh, even within uh, a subgroup uh, by race and ethnicity, uh, an increase like uh, that over just a one-year period. So a lot revealed in just this snapshot in infant mortality over time. A uh, slightly busier slide, but uh, the message is the same here. And this is looking at uh, age-adjusted uh, death rates per 100,000 population, breaking it down again by race and ethnicity. And just to point to um, um, uh, uh, one cause of death, uh, diabetes, you can see a uh, 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 black mortality rate, again, adjusted for age, twice that of um, uh, the white population in the United States. Not quite as severe for heart disease or cancer, uh, but again, these are differences that continue to persist over time. A little more data, and I, I, I think I'm, I wanna just shift gears a little bit, uh, throwing a lot of um, um, uh, data at you in a short period of time, but uh, I think it's really important 
yes, to take stock of that snapshot from year to year, uh, but to look at these trends over time. And what both of these slides highlight is just the absolute um, of stability of that, again, gradient in health uh, by race and ethnicity. When we look at infant deaths, so um, uh, the preceding slide adds another year of data to that. Um, uh, when we look at um, uh, the total population represented by the gray bar, uh, what you see is uh, American Indian, American Indian rather, and Alaska Natives uh, much higher uh, than the average um, uh, black uh, infant mortality rates even higher than that. Uh, I did not pick out the colors on these bars, so don't shoot the messenger on that one. Um, I don't know why uh, CDC picks these colors, but again, what they highlight is um, modest, maybe slight improvement in infant mortality uh, uh, for uh, most segments of the population, but the persistence of those inequalities. Likewise, when we look at life expectancy, that is uh, 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 the average number of uh, years uh, one can expect to live uh, if you were uh, born in any one of those given years, 2007 to 27, 18, really no break in the trend. Uh, if anything, uh, what we've seen is a little, little decline in all groups in uh, life expectancy, but again, that um, uh, white-black uh, uh, difference is, is like the unemployment rate. It's like uh, a lot of economic indicators. Um, uh, there may be improvement in black life expectancy, uh, but uh, the inequalities and the disparities uh, persist. Talked about uh, a lot there about life and death. Just want to share a couple of slides uh, that look at um, what we refer to in the business as uh, morbidity trends. Uh, and this is uh, each year the uh, National Center for Health Statistics undertakes a survey in which uh, they ask a variety of questions to determine whether uh, 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 children uh, in the U.S. Um, have uh, a current diagnosis of asthma or, be, or being treated for asthma. And again, uh, the, the striking thing is over uh, the decade for which we have the uh, most current data, uh, a persistence of uh, black-white uh, disparities um, uh, in asthma reported by households. Um, a similar story when we look at uh, teen births among uh, um, uh, the youngest women in the country, uh, 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 disparities. Now, if there's any uh, positive uh, uh, thing about uh, the information here, as we've seen a steady uh, decline, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, substantial reductions, in teen births, uh, but again, the takeaway is the disparities. I wanted to conclude, I think it would almost be remiss uh, if I didn't include a little information on coronavirus. Uh, this was uh, some information uh, that was uh, published in a, a recent copy of the New York Times, uh, looking at uh, coronavirus uh, cases by race and ethnicity. Uh, uh, I don't want to sound like a smarty pants, but this doesn't surprise me. Uh, everything we've uh, discussed and mentioned up to this particular points uh, would lead one uh, to suspect that there are uh, racial and ethnic disparities in who is affected most by the current uh, pandemic. Uh, and what we have here, uh, and this is cases, this is not mortality. Uh, we're still waiting on better um, uh, hospitalization and mortality data. Um, uh, but again, it highlights uh, substantial differences when one compares white versus black or white versus Latino uh, with respect uh, to cases per, uh, per 10,000 people. Little footnote here, get on my soapbox for just a second and point out uh, this data was obtained by the New York Times from the Centers to Disease Control uh, through a Freedom of Information uh, request. That is to say, this is not uh, data that, this is data that the CDC sits on, uh, but is not um, uh, willingly uh, providing to the public. And I would urge groups uh, uh, like yours and uh, others uh, to begin to demand that county states and the federal government uh, release that data so that we can have a full picture of who is bearing the burden of uh, the coronavirus um, um, uh, pandemic. Uh, 
and that includes not just positive cases uh, in communities, but um, uh, hospitalization rates, uh, ventilator use, and uh, mortality by race and ethnicity, among other things. So focusing upstream and to um, a return to that analogy uh, is critical uh, if we are um, uh, to uh, advance not just uh, population health, but health equity. Uh, I borrowed a definition here from uh, Paula Braverman and uh, colleagues uh, who published a great little uh, manuscript uh, titled Wealth Matters for Health Equity. I would have used that term, but uh, somebody already got it. Uh, a great way of thinking about health equity. Uh, they argue that health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as poss possible. Uh, they, they've artfully sidestepped um, uh, kind of a straw man of uh, healthy quality to say that uh, our, our aspiration should be equity, and that is um, uh, leveling uh, uh, the opportunity playing field. Uh, achieving health equity, again, requires looking upstream, addressing poverty and discrimination, addressing lack of access to good jobs with fair pay. Uh, uh, advancing quality education and housing. And then finally, I would argue, uh, making sure that we have safe environments within which to live, work, and play. I live in Reno, uh, spend very little time in Las Vegas, but uh, my guess is that if you looked at uh, those two zip codes, I was contrasting 89106 versus 89139, uh, uh, much safer environments within which to live, work, and play uh, in that latter zip code. Now I'm going to uh, spend just uh, a, a few seconds uh, tying a bow on this presentation by uh, 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 saying that uh, a lot of our data on uh, uh, social determinants of health uh, uh, with respect to income and wealth has focused on uh, income. Uh, but there is uh, an emerging literature that is looking at um, uh, the, the absolute importance of wealth and particularly the intergenerational transmission of wealth uh, uh, on health outcomes. And uh, this fuzzy little diagram didn't, didn't quite uh, copy as well as I, I thought to the slide uh, comes from that uh, document that I uh, referenced a couple of times, Wealth Matters for Health Equity. Uh, but the, uh, the, the takeaway that I want you to be thinking about is how greater parental um, uh, wealth and income not only trans in, uh, 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 translates into uh, uh, improved educational uh, and, and health outcomes to children uh, in the short term, or the short time uh, rather, uh, it also translates into a greater likelihood of lifelong health uh, uh, for children. Uh, and so uh, their argument is uh, let's don't limit our, our focus to um, uh, what a parent is uh, making in income in one year, but uh, those accumulated assets, resources, uh, property, retirement uh, accounts, and so forth, how does that translate into inherited wealth for kids uh, and lifelong health uh, uh, for uh, the children uh, of those parents? Now this is the uh, busiest slide I'll ever present, uh, but uh, bear with me here uh, because it's a point I wanna make uh, with respect uh, to our topic today of uh, uh, racial differences in health and well-being and their relationship uh, to wealth. Uh, this is a, a, a diagram that came out of uh, recent county health rankings and roadmaps report. Uh, it's an annual release of county level data. Great, great resource, uh, uh, regardless of where you live in uh, Nevada, because it's all uh, data broken down uh, to the county level. That is health outcomes as well as uh, what's driving those outcomes. And I wanted to share this um, um, uh, to, to make a couple of points. One is if we look at um, uh, child poverty in Nevada, the most recent data that we have for that uh, is 2018 data that was uh, presented in this report. Our state overall value is about the national uh, average of uh, uh, 18 or 19 percent. We should be embarrassed uh, by that uh, for starters, um, uh, one in five kids living in poverty. But then when we break it down by race and ethnicity, what we see uh, again 
are uh, uh, Native American and Black values well above the state uh, uh, average, well above the national average. And uh, we break it down even further, the little orange um, uh, uh, dots or circles there, we see a lot of uh, variation in child poverty when uh, we look at different counties. Uh, we have some counties uh, uh, in Nevada in which um, uh, uh, the childhood poverty rate for Native Americans is above 50%. Um, uh, the, the values for uh, childhood poverty uh, among African American or Black children uh, well above 25%. So when we think about addressing uh, uh, those social and economic and wealth related uh, disparities in health, we need to be careful and targeted in our approach um, uh, because as we drill down from the state level to the county level to the local level, uh, there is a lot of variation in an estate uh, 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 that is uh, scarce in resources to address those uh, health and social problems uh, we need to be targeted. I want to conclude uh, by um, uh, 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 sharing a, another diagram that uh, of the county health rankings and roadmaps um, uh, orient their uh, data uh, uh, release and uh, uh, policy recommendations uh, to highlight that when we're talking upstream, we're talking about those health factors, we're talking about policy that drives those health factors, we're going to address those health uh, factors that largely have nothing to do with clinical care. They have everything uh, to do with um, uh, tobacco uh, and e-cigarette con control, addressing nutrition issues by addressing uh, food deserts. There's actually a, a new term called food, um, uh, food swamps, and that is, uh, yeah, you can get um, uh, uh, sugar, sugary beverages and uh, uh, other, other stuff, uh, but we would hardly call that food. Uh, upstream means looking at housing policy, transportation policy, violence prevention. One of the concerns of a lot of people in public health is um, uh, domestic violence and gun violence uh, uh, that is going up uh, uh, part and parcel with uh, the pandemic. Finally, and I would end there on family and social supports, but uh, maybe segue uh, into Bina's presentation by uh, referring to the absolute importance of income uh, and employment, again, as part of uh, those upstream policies. Now, I've, I've kind of uh, uh, taken some swipes at the importance of clinical care, but would just uh, 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 make the, the concluding note uh, that clinical care, of course, remains important and access. Um, um, uh, uh, state legislature uh, just took a, a nasty swipe at the Medicaid budget, and I would argue that that is going to affect uh, the most vulnerable populations in the state uh, uh, that have been the most impacted uh, by the pandemic. It's a cruel irony, uh, so I never want to be entirely dismissive of the importance of clinical care, but just again highlight that um, uh, these other drivers or factors uh, uh, need uh, the same, if not more, uh, uh, policy uh, attention. Maybe we can discuss uh, government a little bit uh, uh, in our uh, uh, Q&A session of that, but um, I kind of feel like right now that we might be on the cusp of a change in the way uh, the American public looks at government. Uh, uh, since the uh, Reagan administration in the early 80s, we've seen um, uh, uh, government attacked. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, public officials uh, 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 taken, to, taken to task, and it's been a, a kind of a long anti-government uh, 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 period in this uh, country that I think might be, I think it might be shifting. Uh, um, I'm optimistic uh, that some of the issues that we're facing uh, whether it's uh, criminal justice reform, uh, whether it's public health approaches, whether it's uh, addressing the, the, sta the uh, uh, safety net in this country, uh, which is being stretched like it's never been stretched in my lifetime, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, only uh, way that we're going to uh, make progress in that is to rethink um, uh, the role of government in, in society. 
Uh, I will conclude with a, a quote. I always like to end on a positive uh, note. This is, uh, I was reading an uh, obituary of the uh, late civil rights icon, John Lewis, uh, and uh, Congressman, I, I, by all accounts, he was working for the residents of the fifth district in Georgia up to, to the last week of his life, who said, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle uh, uh, of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Now he wasn't uh, speaking to health equity in those remarks, but uh, it's a great quote because advancing health equity and addressing uh, the, the factors responsible for disparities uh, is life, lifelong work, uh, but it's the good fight. That is my last slide there, Kip. Thank you, John. Really, really appreciate it. Um, a, a wealth of information. Uh, before, I've got a couple follow-up questions. Uh, Tracy, I just want to see, do we have anybody on the line that uh, has a question to ask via phone? I don't think we have anything on text as of right now. Um, we don't have anything through chat. Does anyone on a phone line have a question? Please unmute yourself. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask a question. Uh, I, you know, I I, uh, I reflect. Um, I definitely see why uh, Senator Spearman focused so much on that life expectancy map there, John. I mean, the the, the disparity of literally walking on foot between one neighborhood and, and another is is so stark in in Southern Nevada there. Um, and I wanted to tie that into something else you talked about back to the beginning of your presentation and, and talking about social gradients and how. You said that the, the health and socioeconomic factors have compounding effects that accumulate over time. And we're looking at life expectancy specifically. Is that a gap that we are seeing widening greatly? Is it narrowing at all? What's the trend on something like that? I, what the data point to uh, is a narrowing over time, but the, the persistence, okay? And... Um, uh, what we don't see, uh, uh, what we also don't see are any, any substantial breaks in, in the, those disparities uh, over time. And I, I think, uh, so the same data can be looked at very differently. And that is uh, improvements in life expectancy, a little bit of a narrowing of the gap. But the striking thing is that the persistence of the gap. And I've, I've uh, dating myself, but I've been looking at this, this data uh, for most of my career, 30, 35 years, and um, uh, still stunned uh, at the end of the day about how persistent uh, those differences are. Um, if you look at the uh, unemployment rate that's been collected by the Department of Labor for 50 or 60 years, uh, yes, um, uh, uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, Black Americans uh, had uh, historically low uh, unemployment rates, but if you look at that same data, the disparities between black and white uh, have persisted uh, forever, uh, okay? And just as the economy tanks, you will see those um, uh, rates go up uh, for both group, groups, but I will guarantee you in the next release that that, that um, um, two to one ratio will persist. And, and that is something I always like to argue to students or policymakers is that's beyond the individual. That is a characteristic of society, that's 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 the consequence uh, of being in one group or, or one segment of society versus another. And Bina, John, both. I want to I want to bring in the, the COVID nineteen discussion to this. You addressed it already, John. But again, back to this compounding accumulation here. And now we've got the COVID nineteen crisis and how it is disproportionately affecting persons of color, families of color. Is there any way getting around, even with some of the federal relief we are seeing and all the all the motions, all the strategies that states are trying to employ, local governments are trying to employ, is there any way getting around that we're not going to see significant health disparities beyond just COVID itself? And then, of course, the wealth disparities as well. Uh, Bina, let's start with you. Um, I mean, I, I think that COVID-19 
is just exposing longstanding inequities that have existed. I, and I, the thing that gives me the most hope at this moment is that we're having this dialogue more explicitly around race and racial equity. I mean, I think part of what, um, as John was saying, he wasn't surprised about um, seeing that disparity in the data. And it's part of it is because um, communities of color are mo more vulnerable in the work that they do, have less savings of wealth and networks um, because of all the, the history of discrimination we discussed. Um, so unless we begin to really address those root causes, uh, we're not going to really see, I, I don't feel hopeful that there will be a difference, but I do feel hopeful that we're having this discussion and hopefully we be can begin to think about identifying strategies to support those who are struggling most in our economy. I mean, there's been stories um, and data that show that if we address the needs of those who are most vulnerable, our most vulnerable groups um, by race, by economic status, we will all be better off. We will have created the strategies that work for all of us that create a more resilient economy for all of us. So I, I'm hoping that we're beginning to have that conversation. And, and, and yeah, John, I would just I would oh, just John, echo, I would just echo that. Um, one of my uh, uh, interests in health equity, I alluded to, to living in Sweden uh, for a year, and one of the most striking things about Sweden, uh, highly uh, uh, industrialized, developed, capitalist economy, uh, just like the United States. But one of the striking things about Sweden is not that they have class differences, but they are much narrower. That's the society I want to live in. I, I don't live in some uh, delusional uh, uh, state where I don't, I, I think we can eliminate class inequalities. I would like to see them compressed. In Sweden, you cannot tell a person's um, a social class position uh, 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 by a, a lot of health in, in indicators uh, uh, because it's, those health outcomes are not reflected like they are uh, in the United States. And John, to that point, to address some of the inequalities, uh, Bina, let's have you move on to the second part, part of your presentation, if we could. All righty. Um, here we go, part two. I, um, I'll go quickly so we have a little bit of time for discussion. And um, a lot of what you'll see here is covered in some of the remarks that John made as well. So I'm going to be talking about this example, um, looking at how we could improve health at birth with unconditional cash. So John shared those really striking themes around infant mortality, and this, this data uh, basically echoes that. This is looking at preterm birth over time, and preterm birth is one of the main reasons, the main drivers of infant mortality, of death within one year of life, but it's also an indicator that, um, you know, it describes people's future life chances as well. We know that preterm birth is linked to lower educational attainment, lower uh, wages as adults. So these, this is a marker um, of future life chances. And we see this stark disparity. The blue line is um, black pregnant people and their rates of preterm birth. And the line across the bottom, that light green, green line is, is white people. And I was really happy to see Pacific Islander broken out in that data that John put forward and, um, and also um, American Indian, um, Native American data, because I think that those groups have faced similar marginalized experiences in the United States, and that just manifests so clearly in these data. I mean, this is a measure that just tells us how well we're doing as a society. And generally speaking, for all of us, the United States performs really poorly. One in 10 babies are born early in the United States. We were uh, in recent studies, comparisons to other developed countries, we're 19 out of 19 at the bottom of, um, in terms of preterm birth. And these, um, this also has significant costs to society, an estimated $26 billion a year of costs of babies being born early. And connecting it back to what I said about our shared prosperity, if we overlook and undervalue the potential of um, communities of color starting at birth, we're not going to see the shared prosperity and economic growth we want to see in our economy. 
So um, what what's so I want to also I want to note here that there's been a lot of work around getting at medical care access, doing behavioral interventions, and nothing has really worked to sort of shift this in any marked way. And so what's driving that? The, the reason that this is complicated is because babies are not blank slates. As we've been talking about, um, health develops as a result of our experiences and opportunities over a lifetime, and particularly those that happen during critical time periods of development. During pregnancy, early childhood, adolescence, these are times where things that happen will have lifelong impacts and even pass through to the next generation. And these opportunities and experiences, of course, are shaped by our household environments, but also by the neighborhoods in which we live, the streets on which people play. Um, and that has been shaped, as we talked about, by institutions and policies that are really you know, looking at structural marginalization across these group identities or structural racism in particular when we look at the black-white differences. So I really wanna draw attention um, here to uh, black-white differences because you know, when we talk about communities of color, it's important to note that they don't all have the same experiences, right? There is a, a really stark reason that we see poor birth outcomes amongst African-American people and that is because um, anti-black racism is really real and baked into so many of our institutions and interactions. So again, uh, highlighting all of this at the root of that, and what I mean by babies are not blank slates is that they have this history in their biology, right? This history of discrimination, of um, you know, housing policy that resulted in a lack of wealth building in, in black communities. Um, Babies, so preterm birth then is both a marker of the future, but also one of the past. It's, it's a really interesting indicator. So while we know that um, pregnancy is this really important time period of development, things that happen during that time have lifelong impacts, we also see in the data that income volatility is, is huge during pregnancy. On average, um, households experience a 10% decline in income. And for single mothers who live without other adults, that's 42%. Um, so th this is important for our collective health, right? Why are we not really supporting people during pregnancy? And I, so I want to note, coming back to this idea of wealth. Wealth, you know, as, as we've been talking about in a technical definition, assets minus liabilities. But really what wealth means is the ability to weather crises, the ability to plan for the future, the ability to take a breath instead of just being faced with constant challenges. And so as you start to think about that in the body, a lot of research has pointed to the, the role of toxic stress and the disruption of the stress response and how these social factors get in the body. And so when you think about wealth, it's almost like an antidote or buffer to that, um, the stress that comes with the volatility of income. And as we've talked about before, in terms of wealth, there's this huge um, racial wealth gap, and it's actually widened over time. So in 1998, um, I'm sorry, I have this little bar that's blocking my view of the slide. In 1998, um, black households had 19% of the wealth of white households, and in 2006, that's dropped to about 10%. And also um, in 2006, over 25% of black households have negative wealth. And just hammering this point again about income is not the same as wealth. Um, here you see a ratio of wealth to income for white households, it's 210%. And for black households, it's less than 40%. And this racial wealth gap is wide across every level of income, age, education, and marital status. So even the most educated black households are facing a huge wealth gap. And this sort of squares with the data that we've seen what drives um, health disparities at birth. We see that across income levels for Black people. So I think that wealth might be a really important a part of this equation. And so when we look at this in, re in relation to, and we think about this in relation to income shocks, um, these data show that income shocks have a heavy impact on Black households. The, the blue bar shows white respondents and the green bar shows Black respondents. So black people are more likely to have experienced an income shock in the last year, what, about one in five households. And when you look down the bars, they're less likely to receive financial assistance from friends and family in emergencies, are more likely to have to borrow in an emergency, 
to um, dip into savings, to postpone payments, um, sorry, to, sorry, to postpone payments, to be delinquent. And um, what's interesting here is that behavior, individual behavior is not what's driving this because in these data, more black households are actually saving for an emergency than white households. So, and you really have to put it together with those previous slides about what are the structural factors that resulted in this gap. It's not individual behavior, it's these other policy and practice root causes. So summing it up, due to a history of racist policies and practices in the US, black households face greater income volatility than white, white households and have fewer options to weather it. And intervening during pregnancy and early childhood is essential to reduce toxic stress and to reduce health inequities. So I'm gonna share one example that um, I think is a very promising approach. It's called the Abundant Birth Project and it's based here in San Francisco. And it's led by a group called Expecting Justice, which is a collective impact effort out of the SF Department of Public Health, focused specifically on reducing preterm birth and preterm birth disparities, particularly what we see in San Francisco is that the disparities are highest amongst Black and Pacific Islander pregnant people. So this is a little flyer that was posted on Facebook. Uh, we, at this point, so I've been on the steering committee for Expecting Justice for the past several years, and I'm an advisor to the Abundant Birth Project. And we have um, hired community researchers to conduct interviews with potential participants in this program. It's a very community-driven program. Um, the leadership is mostly Black women. This is a, um, an example of a project that can really make a difference that's um, really tailored to the community that it's serving. And the idea here is during pregnancy, pregnant people will receive between $700 and $1,000 each month, and that will continue through the second month of birth and with the intention of making it through the first two years of life. Um, let's see if there's anything I want to add on that. So originally, just giving a little context, originally this group was thinking about um, housing stability interventions and looking at the, the realm of the housing, the complexity of the landscape and the time it would take us to get to doing something that would actually be working for this population, we decided let's give people cash. A, a cash uh, transfer can be a housing intervention, but it could also be a food intervention. It could really be driven and tailored to the household that's receiving it. Um, so we looked at evidence from international contexts as well as in the US, the earned income tax credit, and, I, and we're able to identify marked improvements in health from re receiving unconditional cash transfers. And in particular, there was a study out of Manitoba, Canada that found a 17.5% decline in preterm birth. And as I was showing you earlier, that we have not seen much budge that, um, that trend that we've seen in preterm birth. So this is a pretty significant difference for not a very much money. At the time, um, this program started, uh, I wanna say maybe like a decade and a half ago, and it was 81 Canadian dollars a month, and they were still able to see that big difference controlling for a bunch of other factors. So here's, um, this kind of mirrors that slide that John showed us um, looking at that health wealth connection, but here's the concept here that cash during pregnancy can reduce stress, create the ability to plan for the future and sense of control and improve material circumstances. And it can be a way to reduce housing security, food insecurity, and improve um, maternal and infant outcomes. And I, um, bringing this back to what John shared about the social gradient, part of what um, researchers hypothesized what was driving this difference, you know, not just like that the people at the lowest end have the poorest health, people at the highest end have the best health, but that it holds for every level in between is, is this idea of sense of control. And this is defined as the ability of people to deal with the forces that affect their lives, even if they decide not to deal with them. And on a community level, this idea is around communities and organizations changing their political and social environment to improve equity and quality of life. So you can think about how this happens on an individual as well as a community level. And I, I just wanna to touch again on this, even if they decide not to deal with them, because I think cash as an intervention creates a sense of choice, a sense of control or destiny of, over destiny. And it really is more than money. It, it offers dignity, belongingness and connectedness, trust, hope and aspiration, safety. It really is, I mean, when we think about the ways that we have supported people through our safety net, these are not usually the feelings that come up. 
So I think cash is in a way, it's symbolic of trying to do things differently, trying to create a sense of um, every individual having uh, a value and that we see that value and we can offer all of these factors of well-being um, for them to improve their circumstances. And so, of course, um, thinking about this landscape, this is one project in one uh, jurisdiction, but when we think about wealth policy more broadly, more is needed. I mean, right now, our country spends, um, I think, 400, let me look at my, $400 billion to support asset development, and more frequently, those subsidies go to higher income families, which really serves to exacerbate our wealth inequality and racial disparities. And I also want us to think about, so these are, look, this is looking at home ownership and these, um, the colors of blue and black across the bottom are um, looking at quintiles of income. So people who are benefiting. And so you can see the mortgage interest deduction really disproportionately favors those with the highest income, the top 20%. And same with retirement savings plans. And when you think about the ways that our safety net supports low-income families, like through food and cash assistance, they're not really focused on um, building wealth or, or thinking about the future. And they often come with a lot of stigma and not a lot of dignity. People who choose to use those programs have to sort of balance, like, are they going to fall off the rolls of another program if they, if they enroll in one? I mean, it's really, it's not designed to really be supported in the same way that we see wealth building for higher income people. So with that, um, oh, I wanted to really share this idea around, when I was talking earlier about othering, I want us to think about belonging and how we create that in our interventions. And um, really, this is, comes from Powell and Menendian who run the Center for Othering and Belonging at UC Berkeley. And they talk about expanding the circle of human concern. How can we move beyond our hardwired need to see differences and really think about what is the society that we're all included in? And, and just to underscore the point I was making earlier, if we design things for people who are most vulnerable, we'll all serve to benefit. An example of this, Angela Glover Blackwell from PolicyLink often brings up this example of the curb cuts on the curbs. This, this is a trend that started in Berkeley. So you know when uh, disabled people need to get on and off the curb, we have a cut in the curb. And that, so there was a movement to get that, and now we all sort of take it for granted, but there was a movement to get those in place to ensure the ability of disabled people to, to move around or differently abled people to move around. And now what the, the studies have shown is that everyone benefits from those. People who are driving in strollers, people who are running tend to use those more frequently. And there's many examples of this, like even the origins of preschool and early childhood development come out of serving those uh, black families who ne who needed that at the time, and now it's it's become something that we see as universally beneficial. So um, I just want to challenge all of us to be thinking about this idea of belonging and how we insert that into all of our policies and practices. So um, I leave it with this idea: we all have a role in creating a healthy, inclusive economy. And so I want you to think about what's your power, what's what can you leverage, and what's your role. And I invite you to um, get in touch with me or tweet at me. Um, I, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mina, very, very much. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions. I don't think we have any uh, via text. We do, actually. Oh. We do. Um, a, possibly a premature question, but it seems as if there are multiple forms of research that identified the disparities in preterm birth rates, infant mortality, death of black women in childbirth, but is there an answer for why and where are we in finding a solution? And then there's also another, something after that. I don't know. So if I, if I understand that question correctly, it's asking what's driving the disparities? Um, right, the question is in the chat box, if you'd like to open up your chat box. Okay, yes, so there, the answer is it's multifactorial. We don't have a clear understanding of preterm birth. And as John and I both uh, indicated, it really is this larger measure of how our society is doing and how those subgroups of our society are doing. So the answer is it's not in behavior change. It's not in access to healthcare. It's really how do we create the, the conditions for people to be healthy 
And a lot of that is driven by their access to, to um, income and wealth and how we've really uh, structured our society to create these disparities in the past. So the Expecting Justice group is focused on three aspects to address this on the, on the short term. One is the income supplement I just described. Another is expanding access to doula care in response to the racial um, discrimination that people experience in the medical care system. And then the other one is just addressing racism as a root cause and really calling that out and the way it manifests in our organizations and our service delivery. Yeah, and I don't have an answer, but I, I did a little tiny glimmer of hope. Uh, last legislative session, uh, there was a bill that passed that created a more, uh, maternal mortality review uh, process so that uh, when that did occur, even though the numbers are very small, uh, the, the, the state was responsible for uh, uh, undertaking a review of, of uh, you, you know, proximate causes and uh, kind of a root cause analysis of uh, that. I'm, a, I, I'm afraid to even think about what's happened, uh, given that uh, everyone I know at the state who's in health and human services is uh, got the COVID-19 blinders on. So, uh, but I do think that um, uh, in principle, uh, the state is uh, taking a step forward and committing to at least trying to understand why those, those uh, rare instances do happen and they still happen. That's, that's kind of one of the points. Thank you both. And we have, I believe, what is a statement, not, I'm not quite sure if it's a question. I'm going to read it off. Um, it is in the chat box if anyone would like to follow along, but for the benefit of those on the phone. Um, from Isabel, with PSA from the health and local governmental offices through the general news media, there seems to be a dearth of information and strategies for those issues specific to poor communities living in apartment complexes which share communal facilities such as laundry and close quarter shared areas overall, such as stairways and hallways. They are categorized as private, not public spaces, so the guideline of masks and social distancing policy don't apply. This includes the privacy laws keeping families ignorant of who they share spaces with, who may be positive, and if they are or are not self-isolating. In Nevada, the pandemic has not reached catastrophic levels, but if it does, this may need to be rethought. <clears throat> This encourages awareness and compliance in those densely populated pocket communities. Do we have any comments on that? Agree. <laughs> wanted, I wanted to, to come back, Bina, to talking about um, this idea of, of cash, um, particularly in the, the um, program that you've been involved in here can you give us some context on just how much cash are we talking about um, in a program like this? So this program is aiming um, to deliver seven hundred and a thousand dollars between seven hundred and a thousand dollars a month, and it's um, it's going to be rolling out starting in November. So there, there's been a lot of fundraising that the group has been doing and getting closer to reaching that goal. Um, but I want to point out that the study out of Manitoba, Canada. I mean, they were, in terms of what that meant for U.S. dollars, it was $64 a month. I mean, it's not an enormous amount of money. And I think there's hypotheses here to be explored. I think it's very possible that small amounts of money could make a really big difference. Um, and, and so the, the Abundant Birth Project um, is informed by work that I did at Alameda County Public Health. And in terms of connecting with the asset building community, we started doing financial education programming for our maternal and child health clients. And then we expanded it out to a grants pool where people were able to apply for the funds in, in, um, for their own development to start emergency savings or because they were facing an emergency. And in our, in our preliminary data, we found that people were mostly using these funds for basic needs, like if their car got broken into and they needed to repair it, or if something, you know, they needed to replace the diaper bag that was in their car, or to um, purchase something for their business. So I think just the opportunity to think about different ways this could manifest, and thinking about connections with the health system. The health system, I mean, we spend disproportionately so much of our GDP on medical care, 
when we know that the things that drive health are outside of the medical system. And so like small amounts of money that can make a big difference to health. I mean, we think about that on a macro level, we could actually make a huge difference in terms of where we're spending our funds. Yeah, and, and, and Bita, you might think this is comparing apples to uh, oranges or apples to tires or something, but uh, I think when the dust settles uh, on the pandemic and our the, you know federal response to it, those $600 cash payments to individuals uh, who uh, uh, suddenly lost their job, I, I think they're going to, uh, uh, at the end of the day, they will, they will have important health facts, particularly uh, people's mental health and well-being. Uh, and that policymakers now that are debating whether they should continue doing that, they're tone deaf. Uh, those $600 payments matter mightily uh, to millions of people. And I think it will uh, be borne out uh, when, we, when we look back on uh, their role. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a good one. Let's, let's finish on that question. Okay. Providing a small amount of money during pregnancy seems to be a temporary fix. Is there any research on the effects of that particular program long term? I, I really appreciate this question and I, um, I agree. I mean, I think when you think about what's needed, we need to do more. But what I really like about this program is that it's targeted at a very important time of development. So the thing that we do temporarily actually has this lifelong impact. And though the, the studies on that remain to be done, um, what we know from the Manitoba study is that, it, that we've seen improvements in terms of uh, babies being born later, in terms of more birth weight, and those things link through other research to long-term health effects as well as health through generations. So it is a temporary fix, but it's at the right moment. And I think it's something that can be accomplished um, in a broader arena, a broader way um, that can really make a difference. And in terms of the research, so the group that uh, I'm working with, we're gonna give transfers to 100 families. And it's not enough that we'll be able to see these, um, the implications on, on uh, birth outcomes, because it's just not a big enough population. But the the, the uh, aim is to grow out the study and to kind of build more evidence as we go and hopefully to build that out over time. I think we need to think of creative approaches and start to, to research them. And I think, um, yeah, the, the thing is we just got to get started. So that's where I'll leave us. You know, thank you. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, I'll uh, pitch it over to Linda. Thank you, Kip, and a big thank you to our panelists, Dr. Bina Srimali and Dr. John Packham. I think, as you can tell, we could have gone on with this conversation a very long time. It's a big issue. It's an important issue. It touches all levels of um, finances, economics, and, and quality of life. And a big thank you to Kip well, as well for being an amazing moderator. We appreciate you. And thank you to the participants for being part of the conversation. Just a reminder that we have a series next week that will be on small business, uh, or I mean workforce development and small business entrepreneurship. And we also have um, two more uh, following that. These will be recorded and they are available on our website. And in the respectful, um, to be respectful of everybody's time, we're just gonna say goodbye and hope you have a wonderful day and stay well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. All right.